welcome you to Waypoint. You may be seated. It's great to have you here this morning. And if you're visiting, we want to say a, a warm welcome here as you join us as we worship our Lord and Savior. Well, I'm glad I get to be part of Waypoint Church, and I get to be um, on staff on a part-time role uh, with Pastor Chris. And my wife and I work mainly outside of Waypoint. Um, we work in an area of the world where Christianity is the minority religion, and I'm glad that our church is investing in local, regional, and global connections. And um, in fact, right after I get done welcoming you here, I'm going to be going out that door because I have to go catch a plane. And we're going to be flying to an area of uh, a neutral country in the region that I work. And several of our workers are going to come in from areas that uh, have less than 1% Christianity in their country. Um, some of those places are very dangerous places, and our guys are very courageous. Um, for, for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in those areas. So we're going to be in a place where we can talk and we can strategize and we can plan and we can pray together and encourage one another. And then we'll be going to another con country and I'll be back uh, here at Waypoint around Easter. Um, but we train people to worship just like we're worshiping today, but instead of worshiping in a building, we train them how to do it with their friends and their neighbors and their relatives and their houses. And so thank you for praying for us, and thank you for your support for, for all that we do in our ministries.
Amen. You may be seated. We're going to head into prayer time. I'm so thankful for what Mike shared just as we started our time. We don't have to be perfect. We, you know, none of us are uh, to come here. And uh, much, much in the same way as, as uh, people who are sick need a hospital, uh, we all need Jesus. And so it's great to gather together as, as uh, a people, and none of us are perfect. And uh, we, we certainly don't claim to be. Uh, but we're, we're thankful for God's work in our lives and the fact that he, uh, he takes us as we are, that we are called to come to him uh, when we are weak and, and heavy burdened because he gives us rest. And so with that in mind, we're going to head into prayer time. Two things I wanted to highlight uh, that you'll hear me pray about. And one is, uh, it was great to have Dale uh, greet us this morning. And uh, we're going to pray for him and for his wife Dawn as they travel, as they journey, as they do God's work in this uh, area of the world that uh, we'll just say is a creative access uh, uh, portion of the world. I'd love to talk with you more about it, but uh, for our video and purposes, I, I won't say where. Uh, but we're going to pray for him and for Dawn as they meet with leaders, as they raise up uh, leaders to, to help spread the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And speaking of that, I also want to pray, uh, of course, this last week, uh, the, the church uh, uh, around the world lost a treasure in Billy Graham as he went home to be with the Lord. And what an amazing example, what an amazing follower of Jesus. I, I wanted to share with you a quote just as we enter into prayer time. And Billy Graham said, said this and uh, really wrapped his life around it. He said that God proved his love on the cross. When Jesus hung, bled, and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. And this is what Billy Graham wrapped his life around was sharing this great truth with the world and helping to connect people with Jesus. And so may God raise up 10,000 or more uh, in, in Billy Graham's uh, footsteps to help, help raise awareness, help, help the world to know that God loves them so very much and gave his only son, Jesus, to pay the price that none of us ever could. So let's pray. Let's be thankful for Billy Graham's life, but let's also pray for, uh, for leaders to raise up, for each one of us to have the courage to, to share Jesus with a world that needs to know. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so very much. And God, it is a wonderful thing, and we treasure it so much to be able to sing your praises here in this place. God, there is no one greater than you. There's no one like you. God, we thank you that if you are for us, who could possibly be against us? And God, getting to sing the, this great truth that because you live, this changes everything everything. The fact that Christ conquered death on the cross. We celebrate that. And God, we celebrate that not just through song and not just through prayer, but God, through the way that we want to live our lives. And so, Lord, work on us in our heads, in our hearts, in our relationships. Lord, help us to live purposeful lives, seeking to be your witnesses, just as you have called us to be. God, we want to pray for Dale and Dawn. We thank you so much for their part here in Waypoint. God, we thank you so much for this ministry that, that you've called them to in this uh, creative access area of the world. So Lord, I pray that you go before them. Bless the leaders that they meet. Help their, uh, their times to be effective and, uh, and empowering and even encouraging. And Lord, may, uh, may their, their meetings produce great fruit. In, in this area of the world, in this, uh, this uh, lots of people that need to, need to know Jesus. So Lord, help them in that. And God, thank you so much for the life of Billy Graham. Thank you for his integrity, his example. And Lord, thank you for his absolute passion for helping to tell the world about Jesus. And Lord, may we be inspired in our, in our lives, in our families, and in, in our community as a body of believers, may we be inspired to share Jesus with a world that needs to know that it's loved by you. And so, Lord, thank you for gathering together. Thank you for your work in us. God, I pray for Ryan as he shares the message today. And Lord, just, uh, just continue this great work that you've begun in our lives 
and carried on to completion as only you can. God, we give you all the glory and we thank you for your presence here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, thank you again, Mike. And uh, I want to share with you a couple quick announcements uh, as, we do our, as we do our time together. Uh, last week, our Asia team got back and shared about a, a significant need uh, for widows in this area of the world, in Asia, uh, different from, from Dale and Dawn. And this, uh, this, this crew came back after great weeks of work and, and dynamic ministry, and they shared with us about a significant need for widows in this area, this under, uh, under-resourced area of the world. Shared with you guys, and... Uh, asked for help. And I'll tell you what, we praise God because you guys stepped up and we're going to be feeding widows in a, in a very uh, under-resourced area of the world. You guys are empowering a very powerful ministry and uh, empowering followers of Jesus to take care of widows. And so we thank you so much for that. Thank you for giving to that. Um, I want to ask the ushers and those serving us to come forward at this time as we continue uh, through some announcements. I wanted to share with you also, D6 materials are available uh, in the lobby, and this is just a way for us to stay in touch, stay on the same page in what we uh, teach kids, teens, and adults. So those resources are available in the lobby. Uh, Kyle and Carrie uh, help head that up, and so see them. Pastor Kyle's right over there, and see them for, uh, for any questions on that. Um, ultimate date night. You guys, uh, and thank you so much for the grace in this. We've been planning this great event for this afternoon, and uh, you've heard by now, I'm sure, that we had to reschedule uh, kind of family uh, crisis tragedy for the Lafoons, and so please continue to lift them up in prayer. But we do have a rescheduled date, and that is Sunday, March 18th. And if you, uh, again, invited, if you couldn't make it to the, the original date this afternoon, you can come to this one. Great time for married couples and engaged couples to be resourced in their marriages. And so again, this is a great, great event. Uh, Hop on our Facebook for more details or see Kathy Miller right here uh, for more details. Um, uh, Terry, Terry, uh, would you come on up here? As I, and uh, as she's coming up here, I want to mention about Oakland Hope, one of our partners. Uh, great time to minister, uh, families, uh, all ages. This Saturday at Oakland Hope, it's one, our once a month time where we at Waypoint uh, commit to volunteering there. So, hey, Terry, you're talking to us about, about prayer, and Terry has helped mobilize us for prayer gatherings on Wednesday nights. And so, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about this and the journey for it? Okay. Not as nervous as first hour, my first service, first hour, Tom a teacher. <laughs> um, <laughs> first Which you did great in first, uh, first hour. Yeah, first service. Um, this is kind of like I said, first service, um, out of my box. God is pushing me to grow and, and do something different. Um, when God laid this on my heart about prayer, I was like, why me? I'm not a prayerful person, I'm not a prayer warrior, I don't have the words, why? And also, I forgot to comment about how busy I am. I'm a very busy person, so God's putting this on my heart to slow me down. And not only is he telling me to slow down, he's telling me to go out and be an encouragement for prayer. So with the, we started the prayer table with the prayer cards, so you know everybody's filling out their prayers. I've also now, um, kind of added some elements to it and prayer stations to help encourage those who come into the prayer time. So um, we have different stations. Um, I didn't look at my notes first time, but like one of them is like ask God to focus your mind and heart fully on him. So there's a table and that is all about distractions. And on there will be some Bible verses that you can sit and read. And like one of them, for example, is Proverbs 3 and 6. In all your ways submit to him and, his, and he will make your path straight. So there's a place that you can sit and go through some verses. And then um, another one is um, like take, treat, time at, treat time with God as your most anticipated event. So um, not giving him your leftover time because I was really good at doing that. So there is something there that can help you um, to make a plan to him for prayer time. So, and then there's the reflection stations, and, you know, again, with their prayer table, I don't know if you noticed, the top part of the prayer table is answered prayers that are coming in. So, we are very thankful for that. Um, it is 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday nights. Um, there's music that's playing, so it, the door's open. Or it'll shut, but it's open. You can come in any time during that time. You can spend five minutes. 
You can spend an hour. But come and spend time with God. That's what I'm encouraging, encouraging and strengthening our church to do. And it's open to everybody. It's open to teens. It's open to children. It's open to families. If you want to come as a whole family, there's, there's a place for you. So, and that's what, what I have. Amen. Did I miss anything? Or? No, no, nailed okay. it. And you guys give it up for Terry. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Terry. Yeah, Terry's really done a lot of, you know, one of Terry's gifts is networking and mobilizing. And she's really helped us to uh, create this time and helping provide an opportunity for us to pray. And we've got to be people of prayer. I mean, Jesus made this such a priority. The Bible speaks of this, that unless the Lord builds uh, the house, it's laborers labor in vain. And so we can do a lot of great things. And, and you guys, I meet with uh, leaders in the community. I meet with business uh, people and people within our local government. And they talk time and time again, wow, Waypoint does such amazing things in our community, in our schools. We're so thankful for, for Waypoint and these, these things. But you guys, and that's great. But unless it's the foundation is of prayer. Unless we are people pursuing God and his will in our lives, we'll, we'll be spinning our tires. We'll be doing it in vain. So let's be a people of prayer and come in uh, on, a, on a Wednesday night, five minutes, ten minutes. You know, at each leadership team gathering that we gather with the leaders of the church, we always finish in a time of prayer for this body and for our community. And so let's be people of prayer. And thank you so much, Sherry, for helping mobilize us. And if you can't make it on Wednesday night, just spend some time in prayer as a family. Find time in your small group to pray uh, for each other and pray for our work in this community and ways that we can show God's love in what he's called us to do. And so uh, let's be a people about that. One of the things that we've tried to do here at Waypoint this past year is to emphasize our story and this great, great work that God has done in our lives. And with our global partners, and, and Dale could attest to this, our team could attest to this, uh, for each of our global partners, uh, there's a community church planting effort that is very, very important. And one of the key things is helping every person that's been touched by God be able to share their story. So for, for this uh, 2018, we've been sharing our story, and you've heard story after story. And I want to thank Kathy Hefner. Kathy, come on up here. And Kathy's going to be sharing her three-minute story. And it's important uh, to, to have our story concise and, and whatnot, and it's very, very difficult to do. But we applaud you, Kathy. Thank you so much for being willing to do this. And, uh, and just as in first, you did so great in first hour. So, hey, uh, may you be blessed as you hear the work that God has done in Kathy's life. Would you give it up for Kathy? Thank you, Chris. <laughs> like I said earlier, I was going to ask Ryan if I could preach this morning. I just got too much to say, but I'm an old lady, you know. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, that I'm totally amazed at how God has watched over me in this life of mine. I mean, he is just so real when you let him in. I came from a family of eight kids, and I was the second to the last. And unfortunately, at age 11, my mom passed away. And... It was a trying time, but I'm telling you that God brings good out of hard times. And my aunt was a really great gal, and she had come to know the Lord just shortly before my mom passed away. And she took my sisters and I under her wing and made sure that we went to church camp the summer after my mom died. Um, it was a cool little camp called <clears throat> Good News Camp in Gladwin, Michigan. And I will never forget the morning that the lady who was ministering unto us said, if you can't sing the words to this song, then you need to ask Jesus into your heart. And the song began and my tears began to flow because I knew without a doubt that those words did not apply to my life. And so I stayed after service, and sat in my little wooden pew, and she came down to me and sat with me and showed me how I could accept Jesus as my Savior. And I asked forgiveness for my sins. And I'm telling you, the joy that I felt that day was unbelievable. 
and I was walking up the path all by myself after service. All the big pine trees around me, it was beautiful. And the camp director met me halfway down the path and he said to me, what happened to you today? And I said, I asked Jesus into my life. And sometime later, you know, reading the Bible and learning verses, I came to know this verse, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that he is risen from the dead, you shall be saved. And that day, I had opened my mouth and told the camp director, and I, I just was like, that is so cool. Well, the second part of that verse says, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And I just am so thankful that God has followed me all through the years. I have so many more things I could tell you, but I'm pretty positive my three minutes are already up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, Kathy, thank you so much. And what an absolute treasure. And may it be a, a springboard for future conversations. You know, uh, ask, uh, ask Kathy, ask others who have shared how God has worked in their lives. You know, learn more of each other's stories and prepare your own. It's a powerful thing to reflect. Here, God, how have you worked in my life? What was the moment that I really gave my life to you? And how has my life been since? So thank you so much, Kathy, for this part of the journey. Hey, we're in for a treat today. Uh, Ryan is going to be sharing with us, Ryan Leininger. And Ryan is in credentialing with the Free Methodist Church to, to become an elder. Currently, he's a, a, at a status of a conference ministerial candidate. Ryan's led a, a, a church before. He's a very gifted biblical teacher. He has a passion for sharing God's word and uh, doing so creatively. And so would you give it up for my friend Ryan? Thanks, brother. I'm going I'm to do this. I got right. some music stuff here. Okay. Thank you. Ryan. Well, good morning. Uh, this past week, I found myself, um, I'm going to say pulled in. It wasn't of my own accord. I was pulled in to a clickbait article on Facebook. I feel like I'm making like a, a public confession right now. Um, and, and you know the deal with those. You know, it's the kind of thing where you're like, oh, that's a really interesting title. But you know, you're like, it's just going to be a bunch of advertisements. There's going to be like one one little fact per page. I mean, it's going to take me 20 minutes, and at the end of it, I'm just going to be like, you know, I, that's it? Like, that was number one? But I did it. I read it. And there, there's a couple interesting things I, I learned from this article this week. And the, the article I read was titled something like uh, 20 Everyday Items That You Are Using Incorrectly. And some of you have a look on your face like, I read that five years ago. Get with the times, Ryan. Like, <laughs> you might be right. I'm pretty sure there's about a you know, thousand versions of it probably out there. So I, I read this article, and there's a couple interesting things. Number one, um, I learned that apparently my default approach of how I hold dental floss, it's wrong. You know, who knew? Okay. Another thing I learned is that apparently I have failed as a parent to teach my children to drink from juice boxes correctly. Apparently, you're supposed to, there's flaps on the side, and then you don't squeeze the box, and the kid doesn't get juice all over their shirt and face. Sometimes it feels like you have a default approach, and it's just not the right way. Uh, for me, every day, you know, I drive home on I-75, rush hour traffic, and I'm in like, um, you know, I'm on autopilot, okay? I have my same lane, I stay in my same lane, and I've got traffic to the right and it's moving, and I've got traffic to the left, it's moving, and I'm still in my lane because it's my default approach. Okay? Sometimes it just feels like our, our default approach, maybe, maybe it's the wrong way, maybe it's not the best way, but it's, it's what we're used to. And sometimes you say to yourself, you know, statistically speaking, Shouldn't my default approach be right at least sometimes? I mean, the clock is right at least twice a day, right? You know, it's like, how, how could I always be wrong? And you wouldn't be alone if you've thought that, particularly when it comes to relationships. Um, we've been in a series on relationships for the last month today. We're going to wrap that up by looking 
um, at discipleship, specifically within families and, and between different generations. And I am, I'm going to share uh, a number of mistakes, misconceptions that, that I have made with you know, being taught and how I thought might be a good way to teach other people. And, and maybe you've experienced some of these, these as well. Some of these, um, these mistakes I, I've made because it's just like sheer ignorance. It's kind of like you just didn't know any better, okay? But some of them I've made in part probably because maybe my heart wasn't in the right place. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, these things are, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not of yourself. And I don't know about you, but there's been times I've been like, you know what, it wouldn't it be, I just, I want to wake up tomorrow, and tomorrow I am a gentle patient person from then on. Okay. And you think, like, wouldn't it be, you know, I, I wish I could just apply that, you know, to your spouse or your children, you know. From now on, you're not going to bicker in the back seat. You're just going to be, you know, patient and, and kind. But it's not how it works. You know, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We all know that if you're going to grow a vegetable garden or flowers, you can't just, like, plant it and then you just leave it and hope it turns out great. You end up with weeds. You don't get a beautiful flower. You don't get delicious fruit or vegetables. It gets choked out. And it's the same thing in the human soul with ourselves, with our neighbor, with our kids. If we don't tend to it, we'll get the default results of looking like the world. We have to be discipled and we have to disciple others to, to break out of that, that pattern. Last week, uh, Pastor Chris um, spoke on, on establishing roots and he, and he talked from Colossians 2.7. He said, continue to live in him, that is Jesus, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. And today I'm going to share five ways that we can sabotage that process. These are five ways that we can pour poison on developing roots, if you will. So today it, it's not about, you know, it's not about inducing guilt or being like, you know, your priorities, you know, you need to change them. Today's about starting with saying, you know, we all have a default approach to relationships and how we learn and how we teach. And we, sometimes we need to slow down and ask ourselves, is that serving us well? Is, is it what God wants? Have other people done it? Does it work? Because it is so easy to spend the rest of your life with habits that don't take you where you need to be. The passage of time has never guaranteed maturity or growth. Somebody really smart, I don't know who, said the real test of leadership is always found in the third generation. I think, I think that's really good. Like anybody can teach one person, but if you, can, if you can teach and model and show something that becomes viral, that continues on, not just to that person you taught, but to the people after them, then you're, you're really on to something. And if you're here today and you're a grandparent or you're a great-grandparent, you're part of a family that is a, a multi-generational you know, heritage of Jesus followers, that is awesome. But don't stop and don't get comfortable. Sometimes we have these weird dynamics between different generations. And, and if you're older, you might think, you know, well, the younger people, they just they don't, don't seem interested to learn or they don't want to hear it. And, and the young people, sometimes they're thinking, you know, I'm not going to go up to somebody I, I don't know or somebody who's more experienced and just out of the blue be like, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Could you help me? And we both have to... Both generations have to break outside their comfort zone and, and gently ask. And I, I can remember being in that, in that place um, years past where I knew, I, I knew that doing this myself wasn't working, that reading, reading scripture for myself and going to church, like, it's good, but it only takes you so far. And I knew I needed I need people who are wiser and smarter than me and who had made mistakes and were willing to share it and be authentic and share that. And I didn't want to, and it was uncomfortable, but I got to the day where I just had to be like, starting today somewhere, I just have to ask, as awkward as it is, it's like, hey, you know, I need someone to, could you maybe kind of, sort of, like, talk with me someday? And I've got questions, and, you know, and you just you stumble and stare at the floor and cough. <laughs> And God will prepare the heart of someone out there who will respond and say, yeah, I'd, I'd love to meet with you. We'll have coffee or we'll grab a dinner or I'll sit down and, and chat. 
And that relationship will speak into you ways in, in ways that you don't necessarily just get from, from time alone with God. As Americans, we tend to think of our relationship with God as like, it's like this shoot from heaven to us, and there's sort of these, these walls there. And we sometimes have a tendency of, of neglecting the other relationships that we need to pour into us. Every one of us, we need someone who's further along than us, and we also need someone else we can, we can pour into. For thousands of years, uh, the Jews had the, the equivalent of a, a pledge of allegiance, if you will, okay? It's, it's called the, the Hebrew Shema, okay? And the most important thing you need to know about this word Shema, it's really fun to say. <laughs> like if you, you know, it just rolls off the tongue, and there's certain words, I don't know if it's just me, maybe I'm a little weird, but there's certain words, if you say them enough times, you're like, that is a really strange word, like pumpkin, pumpkin, pumpkin. You just, I don't know. Is it just me? Maybe it is. Um, so this, this Hebrew Shema, the, it was this process where morning and evening, there would be, this, there would be reciting of this and thinking of this, and, and it consisted in large part of what is the, the greatest commandment in Scripture, love the Lord your God with all of your, all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus takes that and he adds that piece of you know, loving your neighbor as yourself. And so the Jewish people for thousands of years had this, this amazing habit by, by commandment, okay, to remember, to dwell, to meditate, to recite this daily. God provides the, the, a, a process of how this works in the passages fall. We're going to start off, though, with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So we have this daily habit, this, this pledge of allegiance and so much more, right, that they, they, they would recite, that they would think on. And God goes on to share, that here's the process. Here is how you pass it on generation to generation. Verse 6, it says, You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the ro road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. In other words, God says, I want you to take this command and I want you to build it into your everyday life as a starting point and as an ending point. Okay? Not starting your day with necessarily just you know, the news, your smartphone, what happened on social media in the last couple hours. Not ending it that way, but having this bookmark of beginning and ending with the most important thing, loving God. Pastor Kerry has done an awesome job before of talking about sticky faith. And sticky faith is, is not when we take our preschoolers and they use glued sticks and there's a craft and you pick them up and, and they hand you this thing and it looks like a sheet of paper, but there's something all, all over the back of it that you just, you know, got on your pants or your dress. Sticky faith is instilling this, this long-term love of God. Faith that sticks is, is the idea here, okay? And sticky faith is, is doing discipleship like Jesus did. And Jesus didn't just teach his disciples to, to behave, okay? He taught them to, to follow him the rest of their lives. I think probably the, the easiest way to to take our, our youth and that transition to college and into adulthood, which is, which is so challenging and so many distractions, the easiest way for those individuals to, to walk away from the faith or let it drop is for them to grow up thinking Jesus is like this coat we can take on and off, that depending on who I'm with, depending on where I am at, depending on what day it is, I have a switch and I can turn it on and off. And that's not how how Jesus did it with the disciples. So we're going to dig into five, five default bad choices or ways of pursuing relationships, whether it's teaching others or learning from another. Okay. So number five is going to be the important one today. Um, it is hard to sit still and sit through a message. That's how it was for me, you know, growing up. Um, so if, if you only tune into one thing today, I want to let it be number five, okay? So you got a person sitting next to you, they're tuning out or you're tuning out, you have my permission, poke them on number five in Christian love, one finger only, you know. If you got sharp nails, um, I don't know, maybe a knuckle. Um, 
there is proof that the, this beautifully simple Shema that the Jews had, there's proof that information alone doesn't change the human heart. We have thousands of years of history, right? And we can see that even though there was this dedication to law, even though the, the Hebrew people, they, they were amazingly skilled at teaching things to the next generation, it didn't always work. It fell short. So our first misconception here is promoting information alone or head knowledge versus a total transformation, head, heart, and hands. Um, a lot of church history has looked like people teaching people facts, going about their lives just as they normally would, showing up next week, learning more facts, and then continuing this cycle. And it, the world isn't impressed, and the world doesn't ask why. Information doesn't lead people to say, I want that, or, or what happened? You know, a lot of the, the absolute best, most knowledgeable uh, Bible scholars in the world today are, are people who, you know, they know their Bible inside and out, but they don't necessarily believe the gospel. They don't believe in the resurrection or the miracles. They have information, but it hasn't, hasn't changed them. The Pharisees in Jesus' day, you know, Jesus didn't have a lot of great things to say about them. There was a people who, they knew their law, they knew their scripture, but they had cold hearts that didn't really understand it. They recited that Shema every day, right? But they didn't do it. probably back up the bus here for a second just define like what is discipleship discipleship is god's natural means of using relationships it could be somebody older it could be somebody younger it could be family it can be non-family but it's god's process of using relationships for us to learn and do and share the things of god as we learn from someone that's further along everyone is discipled in something nature abhors a vacuum as parents, we can't put like a lid on our, our kids and be like, we're not going to let any bad things in, okay? Something is going to fill us. It's either going to be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or it's, it's the world. And the default approach is it will be the world. There's no prerequisites to receiving discipleship. So we can break discipleship down into three basis, basic pieces, okay? Head, heart, and hands. Head, this is the knowledge piece. This is where we learn things, reading scripture, understanding beliefs. Okay? There's that heart piece, accountability. And accountability isn't just you know, resisting temptation and having a, you know, somebody else who's asking us about the tough things in our, in our life and our choices. Accountability is is our heart, it's our, our priorities, our convictions, how we spend our money, what relationships we go on, what we do with our time. And then there's the hands piece. And hands is really responsibility. This is serving others. I grew up being taught that like these things, head, heart, and hands, that these happened in series. First you get the head knowledge, and then I'd, I'd hear or be told something like, you know, the, the longest journey is from the head to the heart. And maybe, sometimes, it might go from your heart into your hand and translate to an action. And I think that was kind of a, I, I wish I wasn't taught that because at least I used it as, a, as an excuse. You know, I'd, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not feeling it. Okay. I, you know, I, I don't know, I, I I've got this habit, maybe it's the wrong thing, but you know, I don't know all of Scripture. There could be something else in Scripture that, that says something differently about it, so I'm just going to continue this even though I, I know it's not right. And we use it as an excuse. You know, it's, it's interesting, Jesus didn't uh, take his disciples and retreat into the wilderness for three years with them. He took his disciples and he took them to weddings and, and funerals and parades and everyday life and he... He cooks fresh fish burritos on the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection. And he used everyday life to teach him, which is what discipleship is, is you can only grow so far in your private time or through study. And it's good and don't neglect it. But there's more that we need. Mistake number two, this is demanding belief versus showing it now. Um, I'm sorry, showing love now. There has been a, a pattern in history for a lot of you know, church history where we've expected people, you know, you need to look the right way, act the right way, believe the right things. Maybe we'll feel comfortable with you now. 
And that's, again, it's not how the disciples, it's not how Jesus did it. He showed love from the beginning. If you were the tax collector that everybody hated, if you were the, question, the woman of questionable repute, you belonged and you were loved. And you were discipled in those head, heart, and hands simultaneously. Right. A third mistake that we can make is, is asking, are you ready for the world Instead of really promoting, are you rooted in Christ? Colossians 2 7 again. Okay. By default, our conversations with our own teenagers or, or with other young adults, you know, as they go to college or into adult life, we tend to ask questions like, hey, you know, what degree are you getting? What school are you going to? Uh, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend. And these are all perfectly healthy things, they're good discussion stuff, not bad at all. But when we only talk about and promote that with, with our youth, then it's a question of were they supported? Did we, did we try to indicate there's going to be a need for relationships and growth to come when that person moves away and they live on their own and there is no existing church and there are no existing relationships? How is that going to work? From the beginning, we have to ask. It's not just are you ready for the world, it's are you rooted in Christ? The fruit of the Spirit won't grow if roots aren't established and maintained. Uh, 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. A fourth mistake can be asking is this choice good or desirable or healthy for me versus instead asking, is that choice going to be loving God or loving others? And this is kryptonite for most of us because it's well-intentioned. You know, it seems like to ask, you know, is, it, is this a good decision for me? What's the outcome going to be? It's not always bad. But what if instead we, we taught our kids and each other to, to ask, before you go into a business partnership, or before you decide to date that person or whatever else it is, what if we said, you know, is this choice going to be loving God? Is it in contrast to that? Is this choice going to be loving my neighbor or my brother or sister in the backseat of the car, you know? And if the answer is like a clear no, we need to bail. We know the decision. We know it's the wrong way to go. Number five, this is the big one. We have a default habit sometimes of teaching people, God loves you, and maybe ending it there. Okay? Or we have a habit of, of proclaiming the gospel, which we should, and it is good, it is awesome. Okay? But then stopping at that point and not taking it to the next step, which is you are forgiven. You will spend eternity with God. But do you love God? The Shema, the greatest commandment again, right? The greatest commandment was not, do you believe God exists? And it wasn't, do you believe the gospel? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The, the absolute goal of all discipleship and the absolute goal of parenting and Christian fellowship is that Shema, loving God with everything. John 14, verse 31, Jesus tells the disciples, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. And that this is his whole driving purpose between, behind discipleship, and it needs to be the driving purpose behind it today. Just a minute, I'm going to close this in prayer. Um, you know, the topics like this can sometimes be a little uncomfortable because, you know, we never want to imply or, or be like, hey, you know, have you grown? Um, going back to the fruit of the Spirit, how do things look differently than they did a month ago, five years ago, ten years ago? What has happened? How have you grown? Are we in the same place, maybe? So I want to encourage you, before you leave this room today, two, two questions to answer, okay? Number one, am I growing? And number two, am I helping others to grow? 
You know, the best way, and you talk to any teacher, they'll tell you the best way to learn is sometimes to just teach. <laughs> and you don't have to have it all down, and you don't have to be perfect. You're just further along than the other person. Okay. Maybe you're in a place today, and you're tired, and you feel unsupported, or, or you and your spouse, you're not on the same page, and, and you're just questioning, like, is it worth it? Is what I'm doing, is it working? You are not meant to go through this alone. You are meant to be in relationship with others who can hear you out and can share their experiences, their failures. And it's easy for us to say, hey, you know, as we pray, you should just, you know, ask yourself, ask God to provide those relationships, but you must take it to the next step, which is getting past the awkwardness and asking or offering. Ask the Lord to lead you in how to do this. None of us are on this journey alone. There are no bonus points for independence. <laughs> and some of us, that, that's a real issue. It's a big part of our, our culture, you know? Let's pray. Father, we confess to you that we sometimes have a default approach of trying to come up with a, with a better way or take shortcuts and, and that sometimes all we end up doing is is looking like the world. We need you to stir our hearts, to show us when we're doing things wrong. Give us a desire to, to ask for help. Give us a desire to be willing to share our experiences, our failures with another person, our sin. Use us, Lord. Teach us to, to love you more. In your son's name, amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a great week.